uh, I was invited and asked to talk about how to boost growth and especially to tell the stories uh, what I have had as an entrepreneur during more than 20 years. So you don't want to see any new type of smart ass here saying that, okay, it's about talent and like blah, 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 blah. So I just took the pieces out of my life and, and I just shared that story with you, if it's okay. So uh, our story starts, well, my story starts, uh, with a young student company uh, from here, from Tartu. Back then the company was called uh, Web Media. Now it's known as a company called Norton. The registry code is still the same in the registry, so uh, same company. Uh, it was a student company. We were all like 20, 21 years old, and uh, like it was a huge market. I mean, like software engineering, custom software engineering, all the telcos banks, they needed solutions. So uh, we were just lucky, like in the right, play, right time, in the right place. We did Java, and instead of uh, writing long analytical documents 20 years ago, we started doing prototyping. Uh, which is normal nowadays, but it wasn't back then. So that was, I think, the solid ground foundation for the uh, growth, like to push the growth. But uh, the method we use uh, was actually, we were incredibly stupid. And uh, you know, like uh, the average age who put man on the moon was 26, because only the youngsters are believing it's possible. The elder ones, that they said, like, no, you can't put the man on the moon. It's too expensive. It's impossible. So the same thing happened here. Like, uh, we started to see that might be lots of new sales from Sweden and other Nordic countries. And uh, suddenly we had Excel full that, okay, this contract will come and that contract will come and there will be, like, huge amount of contracts. And, like, how the hell are we going to deliver it? Like, we have to have, like, enough talent to do it but it takes time for talent to be hired and, and trained, so let's start hiring. And um, like this guy, I don't know if he's here or not, like uh, he was the one, like the reasonable, uh, always the reasonable guy who said like, I mean, if you, if you sell all this stuff, we need this much talent to, to get all this done. And uh, he started to hiring and he was the professor, as we called him, like, and then pointed out good talent from, Universities like Evgeny Kabanov and, and Thomas Rammer and like, you know those people like so and suddenly we had huge amount of good people Guess what? The contracts didn't came So suddenly we had huge amount of people like we need to reorganize and uh, we need to find like new um, like New work for them and um, it happened but uh, so we were, in the end of the day, we were just lucky. And uh, so my first, let's say, advice, how to push growth. One opportunity is be stupid. Just believe that like, things will go out and happen well. And if they, go, if they do, you end up with this kind of solution from student company to the absolute total market dominator. So that was my first, uh, so that, use case for you. So, um, second one, that's my favorite one. Boost growth with the help of law. I mean, you have a product, you need people to use it, nobody wants to use it, let's make it mandatory by law. It's a good thing. So Estonians know that. Like, as you know, we have the national ID card, which is 100% copy of the Finnish ID card. And if there are any Finns here in the audience, thank you. You did a great job. Thank you, thank you. But you know, I mean, in Estonia, we are slightly smarter. So we added, we added a very small, interesting uh, innovation on top of that, that your innovation. The innovation was mandatory. Everybody has to have it, even though there was nothing to do with it in the beginning. But now we have the e-elections, like, I mean, I have old slides, so it's now more than 50% already, as you know, from the last elections, like, and like, all kind of good stuff you can do with the ID card. And it actually boosted the whole society. 
because uh, banks were able to rely on that, telecoms were able to rely on that. Uh, if the whole society has a strong identity, it gives like a huge push to the whole digital society. So thank you, Finns. But um, it, this happened actually before my time. When I was, when I was CIO, uh, I tried this innovation for law. And uh, one innovation I'm, I'm really proud of that we did together with the Estonian Tax and Custom. Uh, all the entrepreneurs here, at least Estonian ones, you know that you have to report the KMD inf on the 20th of every month. That's a report of your uh, services you have bought and, uh, and products and services you have sold more than 1,000 euro value. value. Uh, this reform, we put it in the law, increased the government budget uh, next year after the law was implemented more than 7%. Huge. So instead of raising taxes, if you collect taxes more efficiently, you can get a like, significant boost. So that's why this is my favorite. Like, if I have a dream and I know that like, this solution might work, let's put it in the law. And nobody can argue. So you don't waste time like, convincing people, like, okay, maybe, maybe you should use ID card or something. No. So uh, with this, we were like, with seven months from the idea to deliver. Uh, President vetoed it, so it, in the end of the day, took like, slightly more, like a year. But uh, you can have like, a great boost, great change, if you can get your hands and put something into the law. So if your product might need some help. Anyways, next example. Build and boost the community. Uh, obviously, let's take uh, the 10 million example. Uh, because I think Estonians even don't know that story, that uh, e-residency, uh, this is something that happens outside. Uh, we had an idea that why not uh, we grow Estonian uh, population from 1.3 million to 10 million. Uh, because then we are more than Sweden. Sweden is 9.6. So we would be the largest uh, Nordic country. Um, we had a solution that uh, we don't them come to here physically, so uh, let's invite them electronically. And uh, boom, those are the numbers today. So uh, uh, we are quite far from 10 million. <laughs> but... Uh, we still have 100,000, and the program actually generates more than 100 million to the government every year. So uh, if e-residency would be measured as a startup, it would be a unicorn. So, I mean, profit, more than 100 million per year, like, easily. So uh, sadly, sadly, it wasn't developed as a startup, so uh, we still need to prove that it's valuable for the, for the country. But what is interesting with e-residency is the way how it all came together. Because in the beginning, we had just only had Kaspar Corius. Oh, salute. Applause to you. Like, uh, please. <laughs> the, the first CEO of, of, of e-residency. And uh, like, you had the program. You start to invite people all around the world to join you. Uh, you don't have any significant funds. You don't have any significant team. I mean, like, you have a global startup. Uh, you have to deliver it with 10 people. And it was incredible, like, uh, what the team did, like, uh, because e-residents, they actually started to say to us that, please, change that law. If you change that law, I mean, we can operate in, the, in a better, better way. Uh, the e-residents themselves organized uh, support. So, for example, all the Facebook groups and, uh, like, other channels, they, will, they were monitored and, and managed and administrated by e-residents. Which means that, let's say, there was a guy from Tunisia stating, like, oh, I'm the new one here, like, I'm from Tunisia, like, uh, does anybody have experience with the Tunisian tax form A7? And there were other Tunisians who said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you do it in a proper way, it seems that you can offload a, a huge amount of operational cost to your community. If the community is, they are actually true fans of your product. And this was funny. I mean, I, if you're an engineer, you always think that, hmm, what is the economical benefit that the person gets from that proposal? Okay, become an e-resident, 
you get access to European market if you're outside of Europe. I mean, sounds reasonable. Sounds that this might be needed. Guess what? We were totally wrong. 70% of the residents are actually from EU. Okay, let's not go there. Why is that? But, but the point is that, like, they like the idea. And even, like, uh, if you didn't, couldn't see the instant benefit, I think there was, like, 20% who, you have to, when you become the resident, you have to choose why. Because we have to check, like, like our attentions. And I think 20 or 25% said, I'm a fan. <laughs> fan of what? I mean, like, to apply for your residency, you do it on, in the web, but there the digital thing ends. Then you have to go physically to the embassy and give the fingerprints and, like, and everything. So it's, a, it's, a, it's hard work. And people, people flew from Singapore to Tokyo because that was the closest embassy to Singapore. Do you know how long the flight is? Seven hours from here to New York. It's insane. Right? But if it's something, it's something, if you want to boost your growth, do something cool and build together with community. And the community is actually willing to do a lot for you. And that's the like, learning of the residents. The team is still, I think, around 20 people. So it seems that like, it's a huge government project. It's not. It's 20 people. And the rest is community. And we get 100 plus million every year for this country. I mean, some money at least. Um, market fit, another story. So uh, we have a school with my lovely wife uh, called HK Unicorn Squad. It's a school for girls and girls only. Uh, we teach technology uh, and we try to reduce the knowledge gap uh, I mean, in the age of eight up to 10, the girls are one and a half years behind of boys uh, in, the, in the technology knowledge. And uh, as we have our first born was daughter, we designed the course to her, and, uh, and now it has been become like 3,000 uh, participant uh, program all around Estonia. We don't advertise it. We have more than 1,000 girls in line waiting, actually in the waiting list. And uh, that's another way to boost your business. Do something that the market truly needs. So if you find that, the numbers start to grow uh, very well. Plus, uh, if you have a perfect market fit, again, it's easy to find true fans who support you, who help you to organize all this, like who help you with logistics, who help you with uh, uh, summer camps and and, and etc. Like so, you will help. You will find. You can build like a good community that uh, supports your mission. So, another example. Build with the true fans. I think that's the essence of this uh, keynote. Uh, because uh, on top of different startups I have been involved or uh, different initiatives I have built, there are always true fans who just do it because they like what you do. I think it's the same thing what uh, Martin Willing was talking in the opening keynote here, that uh, people who believe in the mission. And they don't do it for money. It's good if there's money also involved, but they, they do it for the mission. And uh, it's interesting. If you start observing this true fan concept deeper, uh, every company has true fans. Like, even if you are lousy, you have a lousy product, at least your mom loves you. Like, so you have one. But, um, but it's, an, it's a question like how to find those true fans and, and how to locate them and how to, let's say, connect them with you so you could actually benefit uh, of their, from the, like, the obsession like taught you. So uh, it's a challenge for every company. And uh, it's interesting, but historically, all great mass movements have three things in common. They have a charismatic leader, Steve Jobs. Mm, do you remember who had the slogan, uh, uh, let's change America together? Uh, the competitor of that person uh, had a, another slogan, let's make America great again. Which one you remembered? 
The first was Hillary, the second is uh, Trump. So we have a charismatic leader, but the purpose, the message that, that that person delivers is bigger than the person. And sure, like, let's make a make a great again is way bigger message like, to the audience than Trump as a person. And the third thing is like, the offer, like the audience, like who listens to them, like, like they see a new opportunity. Doesn't mean that like, uh, it's a money or it's a religion only. They see something good happening to them, with all, to them also. And all the mass movements, like from the Jesus Christ to Adolf Hitler, Steve Jobs, etc., have had like those things in common. But what it means, like they offer their audience like a new opportunity. So we have lots of work doing free of charge in the world. Uh, Quora, Stack Overflow, uh, Wikipedia. I mean, people doing good stuff for free. That's normal. And what is not normal is, I think, uh, Stack Overflow actually benefits from that and makes money out of it and doesn't share that money back to the uh, contributors. But it's just, just a leaderboard, who is the best performer, etc. But uh, money doesn't go there. So uh, how to actually get those true fans and super fans connected with your business? So the future value of the company not just like uh, the salary, but like, the outcome, is only shared nowadays uh, among founders, investors, and employees. And with employees, through employee job options, it's actually only shared in the uh, technology field. I mean, in 2010, I still remember, uh, we uh, talked about, um, should we go and, and do, instead of monthly bonuses or yearly bonuses, let's do uh, uh, options. It was just like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And we decided, no, no, we don't do options because like, nobody understands them. And this was like the technology company. Uh, nowadays, you can't hire any talent to start up or, uh, or a software engineering company without offering options. But do you have options in uh, farming or in tourism, uh, in hotels? No. And to be honest, like, uh, it's interesting because like, why only those three groups? Because the co people who actually help to build the companies and businesses, like, uh, the, the pool is way, way bigger. So the question is, like, 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 when you build a new product to the world, and uh, if you're a challenger, let's say something already exists, how you differentiate yourself from others? Like, what's your effort? Like, if you're a marketeer here, like, what are your tools? Like, how to differentiate? Like, different colors? Okay, that can work. Different mission? Better, better wording? That might work. But what we believe, and what we believe in cause, is that uh, the whole business model will start to change. That companies will start to be built together with the communities. The same way, like, uh, the example with e-residency. You offload huge amount of OPEX or certain type of services or like, uh, to the community. Uh, you offload some sales to the community. I mean, what is referral? What is referral today? Bring uh, one customer, get 10, 10 euros back. Bring three customers, you get uh, 100 pounds back. I think that's why, what WISE is offering. It's a one-time short payment relationship. You do this, I give you that. But what if we actually could capture them and then and, and take them to the journey together with us? Because, I mean, that's how we treat them now. This is our company and there are you outside, out there. But during the journey, they actually help you. And they can even help you more if you incentivize them in the right way. And not just money, but through Recognition. You did something good to us. Why not to give you something back? You helped in us sales, like referrals, whatever, like, good. Uh, belonging. I mean, if you are part of the journey, obviously you get more detailed information about the thing that you are a super fan anyway. And if things go out well and you end up with profits or dividends, 
Why not to share it with the people who actually helped during the journey? So our guess is that like, like that's the founding story of like, I think almost the most, like or all the startups. You have different stages, you work hard, and then suddenly poof, growth happens. The question is like, can you do it somehow faster together with the community? And it always, I mean, here, if things go very rapidly up, like, you don't need like, the extra motivation. But here, can I remember those people who helped me there? Can I motivate them during this period? Thanks to this, can I have like, less cost in OPEX or even in CAPEX? Can I reduce the time to see that if my business starts to grow or not? Make them your company co-owners. Or just give them a finger. So this was a, this is actually Figma. Figma built their software eight years. They had a very close relationship with community. I mean, most of you, I think, use Figma. So uh, they had very deep interaction with, with customers like, OK, uh, uh, what you need extra, like, we will do it, et cetera, et cetera. And then they ended up with 20 billion exit. And everybody who helped them here, they got recognition. I mean, uh, in the exit uh, statement, there was, thank you, community, for helping us to build this great product. Like, uh, we benefited a lot. <laughs> so think, think about all those people who are helping you and who actually could help you more, and just not because of money but because you recognize them, you recognize their effort, you ask them to join the journey, like, journey with you, if they don't want to come. But if they want, give them an opportunity. Build it together. Give it back. That's the new way. That this is the way. <laughs> and the Mandalorian way. OK, and if you need uh, support here, then uh, uh, sign up in course. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, sir. You're so good. You were like, I'm going to go long. And then here we are. We've still got two minutes to go. So that's why Lewis comes running. No, I was backstage. like, uh, maybe there is one question. Like, there is one question. Let's see. Is there questions? Close. Here we go. Uh, yeah. OK. So, um, hmm. Where to go with this one? No one asked, you know, we've got questions. Someone should ask a question of this one. Why did you not accept the 1,000 girls into the unicorn squad waiting list? Uh, why I didn't? Yeah. Ah, uh, it's a family sponsored business, so we have uh, uh, limited funds. <laughs> okay, <laughs> couldn't do the 1,000. So, no, no, we have uh, three hired uh, employees, and uh, their capacity is to accept 800 in a year, uh, every year 800 new ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the moment, like for this year and next year, uh, everything is already uh, registered, but that's why we have a waiting list. Okay, all right. Yeah. So it's not a startup, it's uh, something to give back. Sure. Yeah. How many startups have you been part of now? Uh, as an investor, uh, more than 50. More than 50, okay. Yeah. What about like running, like when you start them up yourself, let's say not as an investor? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, most of them were here like uh, on the screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, we're going to get on to the next one. Tavi, thank you very much, sir. One more round of applause. Tavi Kotka.